This is three questions with Cass and Brian. There we go. Music. All the whole yeah. game. All right, everyone. I actually, uh, I met Cass and Cass was in my uh, UPenn course. Uh, talking about the foundations for universal design for learning. So I absolutely just loved your work. I thought it was really amazing. So I actually asked you to join the podcast because I know you're you're doing really good stuff. And you're director of learning at Nanjing International School. And we were talking before the podcast. I, <laughs> I'm not good with traveling overseas. I am just not good. I had a horrible incident with food that I had to like count on Kentucky Fried Chicken for two weeks <laughs> as my safety food. Yeah, that, well, it happened to me. So, like, at least once it happened, <laughs> right? I remember being like horribly sick at this trip and saying, like, "Oh, what am I going to eat to get out of this?" And Kentucky Fried Chicken was the whole thing. Sometimes that's all you need. Is it? Is that? Is like, do they have Kentucky Fried Chicken where you are? Is that a thing? Oh yeah, oh it's yeah. good. It's sure. you know, yeah. And the thing that I, you know, I appreciate it. Like that was like I knew. Yeah, I'm just not, I'm not good with you know, um, I guess unknown foods to my system. So that was quite sure. the. That was quite you know, the, the body uh, can acclimate. The body can acclimate. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. So like it's it's like uh, we were talking before uh, teaching international school. I know a lot of teachers that that they it's one of the greatest experiences they have. So I'm, I'm looking forward to asking you about that experience. What that what's that like? Um, but Cass, I'm going to ask you. We're going to get into like some of your your inspiration. So when you think of a teacher that inspired you. Um, in your career, and I know you do some really incredible stuff, very forward thinking stuff at, uh, at at your school. And give a little shout out. I know you didn't want to do this, but a little, little shout out to Craig, who's also in the class. Shouts out, shouts out Craig. to Craig Trevelyan. Craig, I was going to ask you to be on the podcast, but Catherine said no. So I'm just just giving you a heads you know, up. It's, it's one or the other. That's right. You got. I got to pick. So who's a teacher that in your career that really inspired you, and why? Oh man, you know I think. Um, it's funny because obviously, you know, in, in our professions and in my role now, I, I interact with so many great teachers. And when I think about my own path, it's crazy because the teacher that sticks out to me the most is my first grade teacher. Awesome. Uh, her name is Miss Barber um, and West Salem Elementary School Cardinal. Shout out. Um, but no, I, gotta, gotta throw one in there. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. I think, I think the reason that, that, that that stuck with me was that, you know, at that age, I was a pretty, you know, early, but keen writer. I remember yeah. like really liking to express my thoughts and, and ideas. And that was just something that she encouraged. Like, I just remember her, like what, it's a little thing, but one of the things she did is like, she, you'd have like your notebook, right. And you'd mm -hmm. write your story, you know, let's say a, a 10 page, 20 sentence story with some, you know, rudimentary illustration right. but whatever the topic of your story was like you had you know a lot of flexibility there and i remember like you wrote the story and then she would take the notebook and like die cut it into the shape of the topic so like if you wrote about sharks your book be became a oh, shark if you wrote about halloween it became a pumpkin or whatever right, right. and i you know I, I think probably my mom still has like a lot of those those books and what's what's cool about miss barber was Years later, so I was finishing my undergrad and I was waiting tables. I was getting ready to go to, to grad school to, to get my education degree. And I ran into her. She came into the restaurant that I was waiting tables in. And I mean, I had not seen this woman since, I mean, wow. maybe fifth grade because we were all in the same school, you know, and we kind of all knew each other. And she immediately, she saw me. She's like, Cassin, oh my gosh, I can't believe, like she, like, and so I guess the other part of it is like the relationship piece, you mm -hmm. know, like. So I think those are the two things that like kind of stuck with me in, in a, in a foundational way. Like, you know, the, the chart your own course and education needs to be, you know, adaptive to the student, not the other way around. Right, right. And also the importance of those kind of deep lasting relationships. So yeah, shout out to Miss Barber. Let's go shout sure. out Miss Barber. There we go. <laughs> what, what is actually incredible like, and I was thinking about this is the pressure and responsibility of like early years, uh, educators on how they set the tone for, um, you know, for the rest of your educational career in many ways. Right. Like I actually think because I had an amazing kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Stock, I still like connect with her every now and then. Uh, I actually, I, I truly believe that she got me so excited about school and 
This yeah. is not, I don't know if everyone can do this, but I, I believe I can name every teacher I ever had elementary, you know, kindergarten, wow. grade 12. And I think it's largely in part because of, you know, how she made me look at school and that experience and how exciting it was and, you know, creating really personal opportunities. Like you said, like I, like I always mention, I still tie my shoes in bunny ears method because she taught me that way. And I think about her every time I tie my shoes and it's just yeah. kind of, and I taught my daughter yeah, to do that. And it's kind of interesting how that passes down. So like little shout out to all the elementary and primary teachers that, you know, for sure. Biggest role. Is. All right. Yeah. Okay. So you are actually the director of learning. So I, I you know, I know that's a, a challenging uh, job. You work with a lot of administrators, you know, I, and I know that some of the, you're like, you have a head of school instead of a principal. Is it kind of yes. like superintendent? Yep. School principal. director. Yeah. Right. And so like, when you think about all the administrators that you've worked with, um, and maybe some that you even had as a student, who's one that really sticks mm -hmm. out to you and why? Oh man. Uh, you know, this might not be a popular opinion, but <laughs> principals know. are unsung, unsung heroes, you know, and, you know, I was a principal before this role and I know that, you know, one of the key things that you sort of learn is like, you need to play yourself down that, mm -hmm. you know, you, you take a lot and that's okay. Cause that's, you know, your role as a leader to yeah. kind of be like water. And, um, but I just, I can't, I, I can't say enough about, you know, I mean, our, the, the administrators that I work with now kind of moving through the COVID crisis. Right. I mean, what, obviously what teachers and students and parents have had to adapt to and deal with, but also include in the conversation educational leaders because they have really stepped up in, in major, major, major ways. Um, I guess for th there's something that sticks out to me from a previous school I worked in as well. Uh, his name is Dr. Dan Hovde. Dr. Hovde uh, was the school director of a school in Scotland that I worked in um, about 10 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. And it was right around the time that I was getting into you know, more interested in educational leadership, I was starting to work on my credential and all that stuff. So it was around, you know, kind of that formative time where you're thinking about making that switch between the classroom and the kind of the leadership sphere. And I just remember, you know, he was so visible. Mm -hmm. It was really like that leading by walking around right. approach. And at first I didn't get it. I was like, what does this guy do all day? Like, <laughs> this guy was have like the easiest job. You know, what, this isn't, and then it just, it didn't take long for me to start to realize that what he's doing is he's got a real relationship with everybody in that building, yeah. students, teachers, yeah. security team, you know, custodial staff, bus drivers, like, and that relational approach is what made that place such a great place to work. It wasn't the mm -hmm. initiatives. It wasn't the, you know, the ticking boxes or the professional growth plan or whatever it was. It was really like, he set the tone as an educational yeah. leader and everybody else was just following on from him. So what, you know, principals to teachers right. to teaching assistants, like, so I think for me, although in my current role is a lot, there's a lot more bureaucracy and that's not the right word, paperwork and, right. you know, behind the scenes stuff, but that's something I aspire to be. I want to be more like that every day. So All right, shout let's, out let's to Dan Hubby. Here we go. Shout out. Here we go. Yeah. He, there's actually a principal I remember. His name is Dr. David Pesek, and I uh, he he was a principal. I remember I was teaching at the time. I was a referee, and I he would people just loved him. And every single morning he would stand basically there at this high school, and there's like two thousand kids. He would stand because it was the the entrance. It wasn't the main entrance. It was the entrance, right? So yeah. he saw everybody coming in every single day. The thing that and he just built relations through that 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 connection and it was just amazing to watch him interact with people he was so beloved i've never seen a leader so beloved in that you know i think he really shut the tone that i almost like i started like asking people trying to find someone who hated him <laughs> like it was like <laughs> somebody's got to dislike this guy yeah, and, I, and i couldn't do something. it i could not do it right and it was <laughs> and i i feel like a lot of it you know like that's the thing that you see but it was like all the stuff behind the scenes that you know that that he really created by actually making those connections in that hallway in the morning. Right. Cause like it, it you do save time uh, when you have to have some tough conversations, you know, when, you know, students mess up when staff messes up, let's be honest. Right. Sure, so, absolutely. you know, yeah. it, it, I, that's the first thing that came to my mind. So last question, yeah. you, you look at yeah. your career, you look at, you know, director of learning, great experiences with your teachers and stuff. If you can go back to your first year of teaching, 
what advice would you give to yourself and why? Oh, good question. Oh man. Um, well, knowing what I know now, especially recently, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I think as a first year teacher, you're kind of in survival mode and a lot of what you do you is like spinning, spinning wheels. Like you're, mm. you're working really hard, but you sometimes don't feel like you're getting much traction with learning or with students. And I feel like if I could give myself advice, maybe I would say something like design to the margins. Yeah. Like, like I think we're all sort of programmed to design to the middle and then figure out ways to meet the needs of students that are not in the middle or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And something, I mean, from the course that, you know, you mentioned before, and I'm really excited to learn more about that with, with, um, with your partner, Katie Novak Katie, as well, yeah. is, you know, if I could have spent that energy thinking about those, you know, taking what I was trying to do for students in terms of differentiation and make that the norm, it, it could have been, Right. Much more productive for me. So I think, I mean, that's a hard thing to tell a first year teacher, but I do think that concept would have helped me earlier in my career. Now that I'm, I mean, I'm still teaching classes in my role. Right. I, I teach a class now, but it's not the same. Like as a full-time classroom teacher, I could have saved myself a lot of right. wheel spinning if I had done that. Yeah. It used to be, I like, I, I think specifically, I remember this one student was in my class and she was like a pretty good student, you know, academically she, she, you know, did some, but she could cause some issues. Right. And she would put headphones on and I've never seen someone so focused when they were listening to music. And I'm actually the same way you, I, I liked when I write, I have music, I have like background noise. And the weird thing is that I think for some people, the background noise actually like kills distractions as opposed to becomes one, right? Like it actually, yep. it's just kind of soft noise. And I remember having, uh, having this conversation with a teacher saying, well, she doesn't actually have that. Like she does not, doesn't have accommodations. I'm like, have you seen her without the headphones? Like, I don't care. Like, why do you have to write? Why does something have to be like, why, why does there have to be a diagnosis involved? I know this helps this kid. Like I'm yep. watching it. Right. And then to be honest with you, it's helping me like this, 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 <laughs> when this kid yeah. is like has headphones on, they are so focused when they're not, it is like, is, is like just kind of like a hurricane happening in the classroom. Right. Yeah. And so, sure. it, you know, and I, I like, it's just kind of like whatever helps a kid, that's what we should do. And like, you, like, and I think that's, you know, a great advice because I think sometimes we feel someone else has to make the accommodation, but we have to trust our, you know, the professionals, the teachers in the classrooms to like, say like, Hey, like I'm watching this kid and I, I know you got yeah. research and all that other stuff, but this thing helps and I'm seeing it every mm -hmm. day. Right. So absolutely. Cass, and thanks so much for being on the podcast. It's great to talk to you and uh, to, um, you know, have some time and I'm looking forward to talking more and hearing too, about, you know, some of your experiences, you know, at Nanjing international school. So thanks everyone for listening as well. <laughs> <laughs>